1942. Close to 600 tanks of the German Panzer Army Africa charge across the Sahara Desert into Egypt. And the British send almost 1,200 tanks to stop them. And then all of a sudden, the ground started to shake. And that was the barrage that started. Two legendary commanders, Montgomery and Rommel, fight for control of North Africa. There was only one thing left for us to do, to arm the enemy as much as we could. The stakes couldn't be higher, and the fighting is ferocious. This is El Alamein, one of history's greatest tank battles. If there is a place called hell, I should imagine it couldn't be any worse than what that was. It's why I... It was an inferno, a scene I haven't forgotten to this day. Sahara. Vast stretches of seemingly endless desert, empty and barren. But just below the surface of this great sea of sand lies the evidence of a tremendous battle. A clash of infantry and armor so enormous it changed the course of the Second World War. This is what I found today. This is a German shrapnel from airplanes, and this is British. This is a German bullet because it is made of steel. If it was English, it would have been made of copper. It's rusty. This belonged to an English or German soldier. It belonged to a young man around 17 years old. I found it there. It's silver. Look at the teeth. All this area was used by the German army. The English were five kilometers from here. The Germans would fire east and the other side would fire back at them. There were armies everywhere. Libya, January 1942. For almost a year now, this part of the Sahara has been the battleground in a struggle for control of North Africa. On one side is the German-Italian tank force, the Panzer Army Africa. Its mission is to seize the Middle East oil fields, giving the Third Reich an endless supply of fuel for its war machine. On the other side is the well-supplied British Eighth Army, relying on sheer numbers and strong defenses to stop the Germans. The British are up against one of the most brilliant commanders of the war, Field Marshal Erwin Rommel, the Desert Fox. Throughout 1941, he keeps catching them off guard with lightning-fast surprise attacks. But by November, Rommel's tank force is wearing out and the Allies strike back. Over six weeks, they drive the Panzer Army 800 kilometers west across the Libyan desert. By late January, Rommel is down to 228 tanks, 139 Panzer IIIs, and 89 Italian tanks, infamously known as metal coffins. The British have more than 400 tanks, including 160 Valentines, and more than 230 medium Crusaders. The Allies appear to have the Panzer Army on the ropes. But Rommel isn't finished yet, as he writes in his memoirs. 
It was clear to us that the British would try to destroy our army with all the means at their disposal. Our southern flank lay wide open and they had a large choice of possible operations to choose from. A constant threat would hang over our supply lines, but the British were not to have the chance of exploiting their opportunities. For I had decided to strike first. The plan is pure desert fox. Push southeast through the unoccupied desert. Then swing north, hitting the overextended British flank. Spearheading Rommel's attack are formations of the Panzer Mark III Special. It's designed for tank-to-tank -tank combat with 50 millimeters of frontal armor. But it is the Mark III's armament that gives it the edge. With a 50 millimeter main cannon, able to fire armor-piercing rounds at ranges up to 650 meters. In early 1942, the British Eighth Army has nothing that powerful. Our long five-centimeter guns were outgunning the English ones. They didn't have long barrels at that time yet. Their guns had shorter barrels, and that meant less penetrating power. Gun. So they could engage us further away. We were definitely on the losing side from the point of view of tanks. The Panzer was a was a better war machine than, than, than a Crusader, without a doubt. The Crusader is the mainstay of British tank forces. It's capable of a top speed of 24 kilometers per hour, making it the fastest tank in the desert. But the speed comes at a cost. The Crusader has just 32 millimeters of armor plating, leaving it vulnerable to anti-tank fire. And its light two-pounder gun is all but useless against the Panzers. I suppose it would have penetrated if you were close enough, but you were too damn close. All that counted was on one side the thickness of the armor and on the other side the penetrating power of the gun. Those two factors were constantly competing against each other. Better armor was built and better guns were built. They only had the Cruiser 2, Cruiser 4 and the Crusader and they were basically extinct. Rommel is betting his 228 Panzers can beat more than 400 British tanks. And on January 21st, 1942, he attacks. In the vanguard is gunner Wilhelm Hagios with the 15th Panzer Division. We went uphill for a bit, just a few meters. Then we were on the plateau and there was an English tank squad. We opened fire. We destroyed two tanks at a distance of about 1,000 meters. And then we suddenly spotted a crusader approaching our firing line from the right side. Put it down when it was around 600 meters away. In the meantime, the colonel was yelling over the radio, shoot, shoot. The Grant had approached our flank from the left side. And the colonel was yelling, to the left. I turned the crank like crazy, until finally I had my sights on the tank. It filled my entire visual field. That's how close it was. 
And I brought it down right away with two shots. That danger was averted. We were surprised by these first American Grand tanks. The Grants, which arrived from the U.S. just weeks before, joined the Crusaders on the battlefield as the newest addition to the British arsenal. The Grant was a very good tank. And we first got the Grants just before the Battle of Alamein. And it was a turning point, take it from me. To get those tanks, wow, it was like somebody giving me a pocket watch, you know. It was, it was the, the, the thing. The Grants are a major improvement over the fast but vulnerable Crusaders. They have 51 millimeters of frontal armor, providing greater protection for their six-man crews. But its most unique feature is its powerful side-mounted cannon, a weapon that provides the Allies with an effective countermeasure against flanking attacks by German panzers. This tank had a 75 millimeter gun in a sponson. That was a disadvantage for us. Because when you were flanking them, you were attacked from the left side, and you had to turn the whole tank to fire. And if there were other tanks in front of you, you would show them your broadside while turning. It was a big surprise. But even the new Grant tanks aren't enough to stop Rommel. His flanking attack catches the 8th Army by surprise. Over the next five months, the Desert Fox pushes farther and farther east, capturing the key ally port of Tobruk and winning back all the ground he had lost. By the end of June, the Panzer Army is inside Egypt and approaching the coastal village of El Alamein. Rommel is now only 300 kilometers from the Suez Canal. Victory is within his grasp. But the defensive-minded British have a nasty surprise in store for Rommel at El Alamein. Here along a 60-kilometer front, they have massed a huge tank force. They're determined to stop the Panzer Army at any cost. The first battle of El Alamein is about to begin. El Alamein, Egypt. A remote desert outpost on Africa's north coast. Today, little evidence remains of its turbulent past. But it was here, at this isolated railway stop, that two of the greatest tank battles of the Second World War took place. June 1942. For five months, Erwin Rommel and the Panzer Army Africa have been fighting their way east, intent on overrunning British-held Egypt, swinging north and seizing the oil fields of the Middle East. Rommel's advance has reached El Alamein. He is now just 300 kilometers from the Suez Canal, but the fighting has worn down the Panzer Army. We had lost a lot of tanks during the battles in Libya and Egypt. 
Our group only had 20 tanks. We should have had 220. By the time they reach El Alamein, Rommel has little to throw into the fight. 2,000 infantry, a few dozen artillery and anti-tank guns, and only 55 serviceable panzers. Any other commander would dig in or retreat, but not Rommel. On July 1st, 1942, he continues his attack. The main thing I had wanted to avoid was the war settling down at El Alamein into mechanized static warfare with a stabilized front. We planned to get through the Alamein line and overrun it before the retreating remnants of the 8th Army had time to organize its defense. The fighting goes on for 26 days, but Rommel can't break the British defenses. The first battle of El Alamein ends in a stalemate. The battle has been costly for Rommel. His panzer army desperately needs men, armor, and supplies. The German army in El Alamein was on the ropes. The biggest problem in the desert was a lack of water. You were always lacking water. It was even worse in El Alamein. It was now 1,500 kilometers to the standpipe, and every drop had to be transported by road. Rommel's rapid advance across North Africa has left him a long and vulnerable supply line. Reinforcements, fuel, ammunition, food and water must be trucked 2,000 kilometers to the front. Using the roads was a dangerous way to transport the water, and a lot of it was lost on the way. The English constantly attacked our water trucks. By late July, the Germans are losing 80% of their supplies to Allied air attack. In August, the 8th Army receives a half million tons of supplies, including 368 new tanks. And a new commander, Lieutenant General Bernard Montgomery. Rommel's time is running out. He can't keep pace with the Allies' rapid resupply. On August 30th, he risks one last attack, hoping to catch the British off guard and force them to retreat. It's a nightmare from the start. 256 German tanks advance towards tanks of the British 7th Armored Division and get bogged down in a minefield. Rommel, trying once again to outflank the British, orders his panzers to swing northeast and attack the Alam Halfa Ridge. Leading the attack are 27 of the Germans' new Panzer Mark IV Specials. Equipped with a high-velocity 75mm gun, the Panzer IV Aus F2 is the most powerful tank on the battlefield. The Mark IV is well protected, with 50 millimeters of frontal armor. But its heavy armor comes at a price. Each tank weighs 23 tons and burns 470 liters of fuel per day. Fuel that has to be trucked across long and vulnerable supply lines. Rommel is betting that his superior panzers and mobile tactics can quickly take the ridge before his fuel runs out. But Montgomery is ready for him with 400 tanks and 200 anti-tank guns. The key to the whole Alamein position was Alam Halfa Ridge. I would not allow our tanks to rush out. We would hold the Alam Halfa Ridges securely and let him beat up against them. The first evening when we got there, we had a short gun battle with some English tanks. Then 
It would have been better if the entire attack had been cancelled. And we got bombarded by artillery and low-flying planes for three days. You could hear the bombs approaching one after the next. But nothing happened to us. No supply vehicles got through to us. We only had a few scraps left to eat. Like that for three days. By September 2nd, Rommel has seen enough. After losing 50 of his irreplaceable panzers, he orders a withdrawal. He no longer has the resources to mount mobile attacks. The Desert Fox orders his men to dig in. In El Alamein, in El Alamein the war in North Africa had changed from mobile warfare into a kind of static warfare. The entire front was moving up, and the new front line was now between the mosque in El Alamein and the Katara Depression. It was a 60-kilometer front. The German line at El Alamein is ideally situated for defense. To the north lays the Mediterranean Sea, protecting the Germans' left flank. To the south, protecting their right, the Katara Depression. 26,000 square kilometers of deep, soft sand, impassable to heavy armor. Rommel's Panzer Army prepares defensive positions, including powerful tank-busting minefields planted across the entire front. These so-called Devil's Gardens were minefields that had been created by Rommel. We used every explosive we had in these minefields. These devil's gardens were very, very dangerous. This area is called El Metaria. This whole area was mined from the railway station and the sea to the depression. 70 kilometers, all mined. So many people lost their lives in the war. Seven or eight of my relatives were killed. My brother was killed by a mine. He never got a funeral. In 1946, they withdrew and left behind the mines, but they were surrounded in barbed wire. They were marked with the sign of death, the skull and crossbones, but the signs were removed. The mines are still here, and there will never be an end to that. Rommel's battered and exhausted troops complete their defensive line at El Alamein. While across no man's land, Montgomery's forces grow stronger and stronger. He has assembled 10 infantry divisions and more than 1,000 tanks, all well stocked with food, water, ammunition, and fuel. Montgomery is ready for a final showdown with the Germans. And on the evening of October 23rd, he unleashes a massive artillery barrage. The guns blasted away. Nobody realizes the noise that was there. It was just like daylight. It was just one wall of flame. If there is a place called hell, 
I should imagine it couldn't be any worse than what that was. The Second Battle of El Alamein, one of the largest armored battles of the Second World War, has begun. October 23, 1942, Allied Commander Bernard Montgomery attacks Field Marshal Erwin Rommel's Panzer Army Africa. And it begins with a massive artillery barrage. It's just like daylight, with just one wall of flame. The noise was horrific, and uh, no, so messages message of death going through there, it really was. Montgomery follows up with 700 tanks in a three-pronged armored attack. Two in the center and south are diversions intended to pin down the bulk of the Panzer Army. But Montgomery's main force will attack German lines in the north, aiming to occupy the coast road and the strategically important Kidney Ridge. We not that night going through at all. We pulled into Kidney Ridge and uh, we finished up there in the dark. When daylight broke, we were amazed. There was a mass of vehicles parked into this small ridge. I thought, God, all at once, half a dozen planes with some bombs and <laughs> the absolute chaos. And behind this was the minefield. They had five or six times the number of tanks that we did. We were always the underdogs in terms of numbers. The English started their attacks with 300, 400, 500 tanks, while we had only about 50. That was the ratio at the time. The German defensive line on Kidney Ridge is thin. One regiment of 600 infantry, 18 anti-tank guns, and 47 panzers. The British attack them in force, fielding 150 tanks of a second armored brigade. And the order to come through with it, we went up on the ridge and did a bit of shooting. I'm searching for a target. That's, that's my job. You're gonna carry out my orders. There's so much dust flying about. That is really chaos. Dust obscures the vehicle which is creating it. It could be a truck, it could be a tank. I'll say, a target, uh, Travis left, Travis left, Travis left, on, tank, Mark 4 and fire it will. You fire at that tank, and if that one blew up, you switch to another one. I was wounded right on the first day. We got hit immediately in the early morning. A shell penetrated our armor and exploded inside our tank. This is a splinter from a tank shell from an English gun. These splinters were flying around inside our tank. The only thing you know in that moment is, I need to get out fast. I managed to open the hatch right away and fell out, more or less. Well, I lifted myself with my arms because my legs were already broken. Open the hatch, pull yourself out, and then drop yourself down. It was two meters to the ground. You knew it was going to hurt, but you had no other choice. The heavily outnumbered Germans have one big advantage over the British. The 88 millimeter flat gun, the most feared piece of artillery of the Second World War. 
The 88, a modified anti-aircraft gun, accurately fires high-velocity anti-tank rounds that can penetrate the heaviest armor, even at distances of more than 2,000 meters. When they used the 88 mm like gun as an anti-tank gun, then, of course, uh, we were definitely on the losing side. There was another regiment on our right, which was one of the two regiments that had come from Palestine, never been in action before. If you go into action, you try and keep the hull down and just get up high enough to be able to use your gun. And they were sitting out there on top of the ridge. An 88 millimeter fired six rounds and blew up five tanks. Three and a half thousand feet a second. You could see the shells screaming across the ground. They're there before in a flash, you know. Suddenly, something attracts you. There's a tank burning just next to you, and you're relieved. It sounds a horrible thing to say. Somebody just died in that tank, probably, but you're relieved. Because you know from your gunnery experience that half a degree on that site, and it was you. And it's something that's difficult to live with, actually. The feeling, I mean. Difficult to live with. By the end of the first day of battle, Montgomery's tank forces had made only modest gains at a cost of 1,600 casualties and 120 tanks. But Kidney Ridge remains in German hands. Montgomery now prepares for an even larger attack one he hopes will break Rommel's stubborn Panzer Army Africa for good. October 23, 1942. Allied Commander Bernard Montgomery launches a three-pronged armored attack in an attempt to crack German defenses at El Alamein. Rommel's men are too well dug in. The attack fails, even though Montgomery's forces outnumber Rommel's two to one. The central advance has stalled near Ruissat Ridge, and hundreds of British tanks are trapped in German minefields. The next day, we sat around, um, and we were shelled fairly frequently. It was artillery shelling mainly, so we were all right in the tanks. Four lanes were going to be cleared, and we would then go through. But of course, it, it didn't go completely to plan. The poor suckers were being machine gun killed. Eventually, we got the old clearance to go. We got through. We got what we thought out of the minefield. The tapes had vanished. And when a tape's vanished, you're supposed to be free. This is uh, the whole battalion, you know. This is 57 tanks following in line and opening out. We went down into the wadi, came along and went up onto the other side. We got under the ridge. As soon as we got up the other side, we couldn't get over the top because he was firing straight up. You could see the shell, the AP shell, coming along towards you across the desert in the daylight. You could see the, the shot coming at you. That was a, a, a tremendous gun, the 88, uh, that the German had. We 
we then start taking on the anti-tank guns fighting the HE. Fired well with all our aids and uh, machine gunning. And then of course the tank battle started. three or four tanks before you could say Jack Robinson, you know, got blown up, you know. You're, you're just there, you're winning it all up, you know. Then again, the next the next thing, up went my tank. And what? Well, we stuck one of our own mines and went sky high. They all bailed out, the two in the bottom were pretty well knocked up. I was all right, I was in the turret. Commander was all right, he got out. I jumped out, uh, pretty smartish, and when I, when I landed down here, there's a teller mine between my feet. I jumped out and that, 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 I thought to myself, well, how lucky can you get? Mayhem going on, a lovely moonlight night, and what happened? Getting a light light I came across, dropping all these flares. And he saw all his tanks all nicely in the straight line and he started dropping bombs. Despite the fierce armoured assault, the Panzer Army continues to hold the line. Rommel expects Montgomery's next attack to come in the north, and he redeploys all of his remaining forces. Among them is 20-year-old Rudolf Schneider from Rommel's own combat group. On the night of October 25th, we took position in an area that was very flat. In the east, you could see the rising sun. The sun blinds you. And the noise, the rumbling, was our only indication of the enormous number of vehicles and tanks that were approaching us. And we saw 400 or 500 British tanks approaching the German lines from the east. We had strict orders not to fire until the British armor was as close as 800 to 1200 meters from our lines. Before that, there was absolute silence. The hundreds of approaching tanks include the Allies' newest weapon, a tank so fast and powerful that it would soon become the best-known piece of mobile armor of the Second World War. October 25, 1942. The Allied offensive at El Alamein enters its third bloody day. And the cost on both sides has been enormous. But despite his mounting losses, Montgomery continues to order wave after wave of massive armored assaults directly into the thin German line. We saw 400 or 500 British tanks approaching the German lines from the east. Circa 400 English the Deutschen Linie. German tanks were approaching us. At the time, we didn't know that these were Shermans. It's a landmark moment in the history of warfare, the first battlefield appearance of the M4 Sherman tank. Outfitted with 51 millimeters of frontal armor, the Sherman weighs an incredible 30 tons. But the most crucial feature of this new tank is its powerful 75 millimeter cannon capable of firing high-velocity armor-piercing rounds at ranges up to 800 meters. 
the Sherman is now the most powerful tank on the El Alamein battlefield. We waited until they were visible to our naked eyes. The anti-tank guns also had to wait until they were within 800 meters of the German front line. And then the inferno erupted. explosions, terrible screaming, we were just trying to defend ourselves, to survive. And the tanks were still approaching our lines. And when the drivers figured out they were close to our trench, they would simply use their trench. He would stop his right tread which would rotate his tank to bury our soldiers in dirt. The soldiers in the trench were buried alive or decapitated. Afterwards, you are just glad to have survived. By the late afternoon, there were around 300 to 450 destroyed British vehicles in the lowlands. They were burning. Wounded men were all around. It was an inferno, a scene often forgotten to this day. Rommel's exhausted Panzer Army holds the line for the next five days. But by the 1st of November, the Germans are down from 500 tanks to just 35. Montgomery finally has the Panzer Army on the ropes. He now launches Operation Supercharge, another all-out attack meant to break Rommel's line once and for all. I knew that we couldn't win anymore and there was nothing left for us to do. On the morning of the 5th, we only had eight tanks left, and we weren't going to get any more. We knew that this was the end of the Africa campaign, but nobody would talk about it. Not a word. In terms of equipment, this was inevitably the end of the German army. The fighting goes on for two more days, until Rommel, with only 12 panzers remaining, finally orders a retreat, ending the Second Battle of El Alamein. It's the first major Allied victory of the Second World War, and comes at a steep price on both sides.
Of Rommel's forces, 5,000 are killed, 8,000 wounded, and 35,000 captured. Montgomery's losses include 2,300 killed and over 2,200 missing. 8,500 are wounded and 500 of his tanks are destroyed. I've seen life just so cheap, just flip, you know, flip away, you know, and uh, you get hardened to it. You learned after a while that you didn't get too close to anybody. That was it. That was it. You, you just had to live. You had to carry on. You were a survivor, and that was it. One Christmas in the desert, up comes the Padre. We've been killing people all day. Come on, lads, let's sing a few cards. Peace on earth, good will the men. I'm afraid, I'm sorry, Padre, not for me. <laughs> and my religion was knocked out of me. North Africa, 1943. For the American tankers, in their first combat mission of the war, it's a baptism of fire. We thought we had the best equipment and everything. We thought we were well prepared. The general said, follow my orders, attack. Against the German Africa Corps, it's kill or be killed. Distance 500 meters, tank at 1230, fire at will. Spearheading the German onslaught is Erwin Rommel, the Desert Fox. He would say, it is your task to shoot. Shoot, shoot, shoot. The Americans' only hope is General George Patton. We felt if we had a man that had that much guts, well, we had better have some nerve, too. The armies of two of the greatest tank commanders of the Second World War face off turret to turret in the Battle of Tunisia. November 1942. At El Alamein, the British 8th Army deals a devastating blow to Field Marshal Erwin Rommel. His once mighty Africa Corps reduced to just 64 tanks. Their defeat is total, their plight desperate. The shattered remnants of Rommel's forces limp back across the desert. Pursued by the British from the east, they retreat 2,500 kilometers to Tunisia, where they face an allied force advancing across the mountains from the west, including the fledgling US 1st Armored Division. Confident and cocksure in their first combat mission of the Second World War, the Americans come armed with the latest in frontline technology, the Sherman tank. The Allies' newest tank is fast, with a top speed of nearly 40 kilometers per hour, and it's powerful, with a 75 millimeter short-barreled cannon. At El Alamein, it proved itself a winner, and in Tunisia, the American tankers are riding high on expectation. We thought we had the best equipment and everything. We thought we were well prepared. I had no fear. The Allies land an impressive initial force of more than 400 tanks, 100 tank destroyers, and 70,000 men. But the American tankers have yet to be tested in the heat of battle and the cauldron of war. For all their bravado, they are rookies still. 
Yeah, we certainly were. We had no actual combat experience. It was a big handicap. For Rommel, the problem is a dire shortage of men and arms. But he's thrown a lifeline when the 5th Panzer Army lands in Tunisia, bringing with them powerful anti-tank guns and long-barreled Panzer IVs. In my opinion, it was possibly the best tank in the world at that time, even better than the Sherman. We were under the impression that we were definitely going to be superior to the Americans. By January, the Germans field 300 Panzers, over 100,000 troops, and hundreds of anti-tank guns. The fate of Rommel and his tankers hangs in the balance. Whoever wins here wins North Africa. The battle lines are drawn in the remote mountains of western Tunisia. The Germans attack first, then dig in on either side of the Fayyid Pass, where they wait for the Americans to launch a counterattack, which they do on January 31st. Their plan, to engage the enemy in open combat. The general said, follow my orders, attack. I had a lieutenant as my commander of the tank. Actually, he wanted to get more bars or something, and he says, I'll go first. You know, so, so I was a driver, so we went out. You could see the Americans attacking from the front. We were just heading forward. We didn't know where the enemy was or anything. I don't want to bash the Americans, but in my opinion, they were inexperienced. In my Erinnerung waren sie halt unerfahren. Our 88 guns were camouflaged well in the cactus cactus hecke. They entice you to come through. And the Americans didn't see it. And then they opened fire on us. And the Americans didn't stand a chance against the 88 anyway. The German 88 is the most lethal weapon on the battlefield. It has a 4.9 meter barrel and a muzzle velocity of 820 meters a second. With a clear line of view, it can destroy a Sherman at a range of more than two kilometers. If the 88 was positioned right and camouflaged well, it was able to bring down tanks that were very far away. The only way we could outdo them is Face them head on. But if they get you from the side, well, we are very vulnerable. Well, sometimes you didn't even know where they were coming from. You know, when shell fire hits, it's loud. Oh, it could be 10 feet away. When I looked out there, it was like I could get out there and get a baseball bat and hit those things. One of our tanks in our company, his 75 millimeter gun was shot off. It was just like a howitzer now, it had a short barrel on it. One after the other was brought down by the 88. either get out of there or get shot up. So you had to move, you wouldn't be stationary. Tank commander says, 
Well, back it up, back it up. He said, let's get out of here. Let's get the hell out of here. Back it up, back it up, Bill, back it up. My feet were going like this, shaking on his Well, he no sooner said to that, and bam. God help me get me out of here. <laughs> That's frightening. <laughs> so we brought a lot of them down. So the rest of them turned around and disappeared. As the dust settles on the mountain pass at Faid, the lessons to be drawn are there for all to see. We thought we had the best equipment and everything, but we finally found out that we didn't. At that time, we just felt we were vastly superior to them in every respect. But it's a lesson that U.S. commanders refuse to learn. And just two weeks later, they will send their tanks down the pass once more. We just do our duty and follow order. That, of course, was a feast for us. November 1942. Rommel's Panzer Army meets disaster at El Alamein. The Germans withdraw 2,500 kilometers west to Tunisia, only to be faced by an Allied force advancing across the mountains. The rookie Americans roll into an ambush at Faid Pass. The German panzers advance up the pass and take up new positions at Sidi Bouzid, where the Americans launch their Shermans in another reckless counterattack. We're aware that the odds are against us from past experience. We're aware of that. No question. We don't fail. We just do our duty and follow orders. The Americans started to attack us with huge formations, like they always did. That, of course, was a feast for us. In a show of force, the Shermans attack at full throttle and with all guns blazing in a classic V formation. They charge blindly down the pass, kicking up such an immense cloud of dust they can see nothing to either side of them including the two panzer divisions, which are lying in ambush. It's a textbook cavalry charge, but it's a textbook that was written before the war, and a tactic that is hopelessly out of date against the battle-hardened panzers. They didn't know there were two German tank companies hiding. They didn't know that, of course. You have to say that this was their excuse. We had discussed on the radio that we let the Americans approach as much as possible. I believe the first American tank had approached at a distance of 300 meters, and then the first shot was fired. And so began the Battle of Sidi Bouzi. There were so many that we didn't have time to discuss who is targeting which tank. The German Panzer IV is one of the most powerful tanks on the battlefield. At a range of two kilometers, its 75-millimeter long-barreled gun can punch through a Sherman's armor plating. 
At a fraction of that distance, it will blow a Sherman tank to pieces. It was a gun with an unbelievable speed. Our shells would go on a thing like the trajectory. Well, the Germans went right straight through. At a range of 1,000 meters, you had to aim only about 10 centimeters higher. Other than that, you could just use it as it was, because it shot the shells at a very high speed. We managed to destroy one American tank after the other in front of us. But of course, they fired as well. I wouldn't say it was blind firing. Some of it might have been, but uh, the majority of it we tried to have a target in mind. I had to duck my head a couple of times, but they never hit us. The American tanks that were following further behind saw what was happening and obviously didn't think they had a chance and tried to escape towards the north. We drove north as well to cut off the retreating Americans. And then there was a duel between the Sherman tanks, which lasted for just a matter of minutes. Everybody just shot until there was no tank left, until all of them had been destroyed. The last tank was maybe two kilometers away. And I was able to take down this one as well. In Sidi Bouzid, we took out at least 45 to 60 Shermans. Our casualties were zero. The Shermans had shot not a single tank of ours. And it was a scary scene to see all these burning tanks in a small area. Two times in two weeks, the inexperience of the Americans has been exposed, and more than a hundred tanks lost. With his enemy on the ropes, Rommel comes up with a daring new plan, to drive a stake straight through the heart of the American position and eliminate them once and for all. Tunisia, February 1943. Tanks of the U.S. 1st Armored Division charge blindly down the pass at Sidi Bouzid. For the Americans, it's a disaster. For German Field Marshal Erwin Rommel, it's an invitation to finish them off for good. The American command appeared to be getting jittery and they were showing the lack of decision typical of men commanding for the first time in a difficult situation. Beginners lack the nerve. I wanted to push forward with all our strength and strike on deep into the Allied rear. Rommel's plan, codenamed Operation Stormtide, is a three-pronged panzer onslaught through the mountain passes. 
and at the epicenter of the battle is a name that will become infamous in the annals of American armored warfare, Kasserine. These are the hills of tanks. My name is Ali Ammar, and I remember the war. Here in this place, there are a lot of dead bodies. This is my land, and every year we find bodies. The Germans were over there, and the Americans were there. This land is where the battle took place. This mountain was the most important place during the battle. February 1943. It's a battle the Americans are not prepared for. Their defenses around Kasserine are overstretched and thinly deployed. Their heavy armor is poorly dug in on the rocky terrain. And C Company of the 805th Tank Destroyer Battalion holds the high ground to the north. We was holding the pass. You might say we wasn't scared, because up until that time, we really hadn't had too much conflict. While up in that area, it was pretty quiet. But we never knew when something would happen. At first light, the German panzers make their move, and Rommel himself is at the front, spearheading the attack. It was a short and precise order. Follow me, and further orders will follow later. Short and sweet. Of course, I said, yes, Field Marshal, sir. They were so close, I'll never forget that. As far as the naked eye could see to the right or left, bumper to bumper. We thought, oh my God, what's going to happen to our boys? They looked at us with surprise, because they didn't expect to see Germans here at all. It was an unusually rapid advance, for sure. When we saw them, I'll tell you, put the fear in you right off the bat. It was my task to scout the area with my binoculars from the turret for enemies inside. Then I told my gunner, turret at 12.30. And then to my loader, load the armor-piercing shell. Range 500 meters. Tank at 12:30. Fire at will. Automatically, the charging gunner would reload with another shell. This was all a matter of a couple of seconds. Oh, my. Uh, it made us all open our eyes and wonder what was going to happen next. American tank at 2 o'clock. Armor piercing. Fire at will. We saw a darting flame. He had hit the tank, and it was burning right away. On the left side, we suddenly saw eight American Sherman tanks. Right away, we took position. Although they were shooting as well, they didn't hit us. We shot better.
you're scared, but you're only thinking of one thing, is survival. So we had several of the guns set up and start shooting down the Germans. The M3 half-track, equipped with a rear-mounted 75mm cannon, is designed as a tank destroyer. Lightly protected with just 16 millimeters of rolled face-hardened steel, its only means of defense is to attack. Seventy-five would hit the German tanks, and it was almost like, like taking a match and striking it. Seventy-five would hit their armor, and it would just ricochet right off. It couldn't penetrate. You just I hope you're doing the right thing and doing it as fast as you can. Outgunned and outnumbered, C Company is cornered with its back to the mountain. The tank destroyers are about to become the destroyed. The enemy was real close to us. We was all wondering what to do next. All we could see is that steep mountain. We were more or less trapped. February 1943, the Battle of Kasseri. A German tank inferno rages through the mountain pass, and the American defenses are consumed by fire. When we saw them, I'll tell you, put the fear in you right off the bat. American tank at two o'clock. Armor piercing. Fire at will. made us all open our eyes and wonder what was going to happen next. C Company of the 805th U.S. Tank Destroyer Battalion is trapped, caught between the mountain and Rommel's unstoppable panzers. The enemy was real close to us. We were more or less trapped. And all of a sudden, planes came over, and we thought, oh, my gosh, this is now we're really going to be in it. We thought that was the end. We're thinking it was German planes. It was going to be Custer's last stand. And all of a sudden, we realized they were Americans. That they started to strafe the Germans, and they swung up over us. And when they did, they had their wings rocked back and forth and followed one another over the top of this mountain. Somebody said that they're trying to show us that we can get up over that and get down the, over the other side. There's a pass up there, so we just follow that, and we can get out of this position. So then we immediately started, everybody going, get over the hill. You could see it looked impossible, but some of us made it, some didn't. Over the next three days, the Americans retreat over 100 kilometers. With more than 6,000 casualties and the loss of more than 200 of their armored vehicles, it's another defeat for the inexperienced and overconfident Americans. Our commanding officers were not knowledgeable. They didn't have the experience either that uh, was required uh, against uh, superior forces. But despite the victory at Kasserine Pass, Rommel's position is still perilous. His enemies are on all sides. With the Americans reeling to the west, he turns his attention to the British Eighth Army in the east. And on March 6th, he spearheads another shock attack, this time through the desert at Medinin. We drove from the pass through the desert at high speed, creating a huge dust cloud behind us so that you couldn't see anything behind us. About 150 tanks were supposed to push the British 8th Army back towards the sea and destroy them. And 
zu werden. But Rommel's luck has run out. British intelligence intercepts his orders and 500 guns are waiting for him. Non-stop shells hitting in the front, the back, to the left, to the right. Next to me, approximately 15 meters away, there was a sergeant with his tank, and he got a direct hit in the turret. Right away, I saw flames coming out of the turret, and him sitting up, trying to jump out, but then collapsing. In front of me was company commander von Schlieffen, and he got a direct hit as well. Blinded by the sand, the German panzers are sitting ducks, unable to engage the enemy because they have no idea where the enemy is. In these four hours, all I could see was sand, 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 spraying on all sides. You couldn't see to the left, nor right, nor front. You couldn't see anything at all. Just sand spraying around that blocked the view entirely. We were standing there. It didn't make sense to go anywhere. I was standing on the same spot for four hours and always hoping not to get hit by a shell. And Rommel's tank got hit as well. It had begun all of a sudden and it stopped all of a sudden at 12 p.m. As we figured later, 55 of the 150 tanks, one third, had been destroyed. It was a disaster for Rommel. This was Rommel's last battle in Africa. Three days later, Rommel is secretly recalled by Hitler to Germany for medical treatment, leaving the Germans bereft of their inspirational leader just when they need him most. Defeated by the British in the desert, their only escape route lies through the mountain passes to the west. But the US forces have regrouped. In Rommel's absence, they've reoccupied the Kasserine Pass. And now they have a new leader, brash and outspoken, General George Patton has taken charge, and where he leads, he expects his men to follow. He told us, which made us kind of laugh, we as men from Mars have no fear of anything. You're in good hands, and you'll come out of this on top. A confident boast by a confident general, whose mettle is about to be tested in the crucible of battle. February 1943. The Allied and German tankers fight for supremacy in the killing zone of Tunisia. Humiliated by one defeat after another, the Americans are put under the command of General George Patton. His task? 
transform an army that retreats into one that will stand up and fight. Patton would be right there hollering, go get them sons of bees, you know. We felt if we had a man that had that much guts, well, we had better have some nerve too. So that gave us a lot more confidence in ourselves, knowing that he depended on us. A reinvigorated American force reoccupies the mountain passes, tightening the noose around the German panzers and blocking their escape route at El Gatar. Here, Patton draws a line in the sand, beyond which the Americans will retreat no more. Learning the grim lessons of Faid and Sidi Bouzid, Patton sets his own trap, and his troops dig themselves in to the hard and rocky ground along either side of the pass. This one is a left over from a gun. You can find these all over the land. This one is also a left over from a weapon. This is my land. I was 10 years old, and I remember it all. The Germans came up the pass. The Americans were in the mountains. I remember the voice of the planes, the weapons. This is the land of war. March 23rd, 1943. The Germans advance up the pass at El Gatar, and this time, Patton's tank destroyers are ready for them. We had 36 of them guarding that pass. Our recon went out and bumped into the Germans. I counted 75 German tanks coming at us across the desert. They were moving real slow. They knew we were there. They were in no hurry and just kept coming. It looked like they were on a parade ground. It's a calculated gamble by the Germans. The Panzers are an iron fortress, moving at just five kilometers per hour down the middle of the pass. Their plan is to use their heavy armor like a blunt instrument to bludgeon straight past the American lines on either side. As long as we were below the top of the ridge, we couldn't shoot. So you'd pull up, shoot, and back down. Pull up, shoot, and back down. Wasn't any problem knowing where the targets were. They were out there. When you're on higher ground shooting down, it's a, it's a big advantage over somebody shooting up at you. I'd pull up as quick as I could and stop. And by the time I stopped, the gunner had his target and fired. The only place that you could do them any damage was hit within the tracks. 
you get hit in there, you disable them so they couldn't maneuver. I remember you faced. When you're in combat, first of all, you don't think about the possibility of being killed. You need to focus on achieving the target. Under withering fire, the German formation holds firm. Resolute and relentless, it inches towards its goal. I'm not being arrogant, but let's face it, we were valiant. We were an elite troop, weren't we? March 23rd, 1943. In the decisive battle of the North African campaign, the German panzers advance up the pass at El Guitar. But for the first time in the campaign, the US force refuses to give an inch. And over 12 torrid hours, they slug it out with the Germans. It's either going to be them or us, one or the other. You just got to uh, hope you're doing the right thing and uh, doing it as fast as you can. Kind of hard on the driver. He's sitting up not too far from the end of that barrel. So that's why I don't hear too well now. <laughs> We were terribly frightened. Every soldier would have this nervous feeling in his guts and would shit his pants. One of the things you had to admire about the German soldier was we knock out a tank and the crewmen, if they weren't hurt, they would take their machine gun off the tank, ground mount it, and lay there and keep shooting. Twice in the course of the day, the Panzers advance up the pass, and twice the tank destroyers of the 805th Battalion hold firm. The losses on both sides are immense. By day's end, 21 tank destroyers and 31 panzers lie burning across the plain. But the battlefield belongs to Patton, and the exhausted panzer force now has nowhere left to turn. And, uh, and that was the end. After we had run out of ammunition and gas, there was nothing else to do but give up. Da blieb nichts mehr übrig als aufzugeben. Und das war dann am 13. And that happened on May 13, 1943. More than a quarter of a million German troops in Tunisia surrender to the Allied forces. The feeling was horror about being captured, of course. There's nothing worse that can happen to a soldier. Until today, we are still proud to have been part of the Africa Corps. El Guitar is the Americans' first armored victory of the war. No more will their battle-scarred tankers be seen as the Allies' weakest link. But that success has come at a price. No, I didn't think it would be a breeze. <laughs> you know, actual combat is never a breeze. It's good. 
either going to be them or us, one or the other, so uh, you get scared. We say you, you can't help it if you've got anything about you, it's human. It's part of, I think, warfare that you've got to accept the fact that uh, you're going to have casualties that some of your best friends might not survive. The Battle of Tunisia is the closing chapter in the story of Rommel's Africa Corps. But for Patton and his battle-hardened tankers, it is the beginning of a journey that will ultimately lead to victory in Europe. Michael Whitman is the most famous tank commander of the Third Reich. He was the most decorated German tank ace of the war. At Kursk, the greatest tank battle in history, he spearheads the attack. Whitman just accumulated kill after kill. In Normandy, Whitman single-handedly halts an Allied advance. One German tank was able to knock out so many British tanks in a matter of a few minutes. Whitman's final battle turns him into a Nazi legend. It was almost suicidal for the Germans to mount that attack. Even though it's been 60 years after Whitman's death, his legacy, his mystique, maintains. La Calme German Military Cemetery, Normandy, France. 21,000 graves, a monument to the death of the German army in Normandy and to the downfall of Adolf Hitler's reviled Third Reich. And yet amongst the rows of unadorned gravestones, there is one man's grave that is always honored with fresh flowers. His name, Michael Whitman. Whitman is considered the greatest tank ace of all time. He was the ace of aces. Many people say that he was a very quiet, likable man. He wasn't a, your typical Nazi. Most tank commanders weren't personally decorated by Hitler, but most didn't quite stand out with the number of kills that, that Whitman did. Whitman's mentality was aggressive, motivated, disciplined, kind of a, encapsulates the panzer arm of World War II into a, a, a person. Whitman died here in the fields of Normandy. But his legend began in the fields of Bavaria. Born in 1914 on a farm south of Nuremberg, Whitman was a country boy living the healthy outdoor life. At 19, Whitman is drafted into the army for compulsory service. As all young men are in the Germany of Adolf Hitler. In 1937, after completing his service, Michael Whitman, aged 23, eagerly volunteers for Hitler's personal bodyguard, the Leibstandard SS Adolf Hitler. It's an elite unit. They were in parades, they were very regimented. It would have been hand-picked personnel. Uh, they would have had certain height and physical fitness requirements, a certain look. He's not only a volunteer, but he's seemingly politically indoctrinated to want to be part of this unit. I swear to thee, Adolf Hitler, as Führer and Chancellor of the German Reich, loyalty and bravery. I vow to thee, obedience unto death. Being the honor guard, I'm sure it was very appealing to somebody in their early 20s. With the you know, black uniforms and the, the smart look and the, the whole elite quality about them. 
Michael Whitman embraces absolute loyalty to Adolf Hitler and his policy of persecution of the Jews. And to his program of conquest and expansion of the Third Reich. But in September 1939, Hitler invades Poland, triggering the Second World War. Now for Whitman and his generation of young Nazis, the parades are over and the fighting begins. Because of his excellence as a driver, Whitman is given command of a reconnaissance vehicle. By early summer 1941, the Nazis are the masters of Europe. But for Adolf Hitler, the real prize lies to the east, the Soviet Empire, vast spaces for the master race to conquer and colonize. June 22, 1941, Hitler invades the Soviet Union. Codename, Operation Barbarossa. Three million German soldiers, led by 3,600 tanks, plunge into the Soviet Union. Against the Germans, the Soviets mobilize. 2.9 million men and 20,000 tanks. Despite their superior numbers, the Soviets are quickly overwhelmed by the speed and skill of the German panzers. Michael Whitman's reconnaissance unit races over the Soviet frontier with the Leibstandard, part of the leading armored force. Hitler's armored divisions were important in the fact that they were the ones that were spearheading the advances. The whole mentality of the tank force was always keep moving. Whitman and the Leibstandart are now part of the notorious Waffen-SS. The Waffen-SS had a few premier divisions, Leibstandart being one of them, that maintained its elite status throughout the war. As the Panzers slash hundreds of kilometers through Russian defenses, millions of prisoners are taken. The Waffen-SS does have a reputation for committing atrocities on the Eastern Front. Over three million will be shot or starved to death. Three weeks after the invasion, the Leibstandart is closing in on the Ukrainian capital, Kiev. At the forefront is reconnaissance sergeant Michael Whitman. July 12, 1941, the Panzers advance over hilly, wooded country. As they near the city of Zhitomir, 200 kilometers southwest of Kiev, the Soviets counterattack. Dozens of Soviet T-34 tanks bear down on the Leibstandart. The T-34 has been a shock for the Germans. Weighing 26 tons, the T-34 is heavily armored with sloping sides to deflect shells. Armed with a powerful 76.2 millimeter gun, it is better than anything the Germans can field. Whitman is ordered to reconnoiter the enemy forces in a Sturmgeschutz III or Stug. Whitman drove his Sturmgeschutz to high ground to try to locate the Soviets. He spotted two groups of Soviet T-34 tanks, six coming from northeast and another 12 from the east. That meant 18 T-34s against Wittmann's single assault gun. It was no match. Wittmann had to act quickly to even the odds. He ordered his driver to take the Sturmgeschutz off the high ground. Wittmann has been ordered not to engage the enemy tanks, as the heavier T-34s outgun his Sturmgeschutz III. A Sturmgeschutz is designed initially to be infantry support. It's not designed to engage other tanks. Built on the chassis of a Panzer III, the Stug is a turretless assault gun, which means the driver has to swing the whole vehicle around to aim its high-velocity 75-millimeter cannon. The Sturmgeschütz has a movable uh, cannon of 24 degrees only. 
you have to face the enemy straight forward, not from the side. If you see the enemy, you have to turn. Despite being outnumbered and outmatched by the Russian tanks, Whitman disobeys his orders and attacks the T-34s. This personality that was mated to the panzer credo of attack, that uh, that would have been the first thing he was looking for, was an opportunity to be preempted. As the T-34 surged forward towards the crest of the hill, Wittmann's only hope was to set up an ambush. It was a direct hit. A second T-34 surged over the hill. It went up in flames. A third T-34 managed to get a shot at Wittmann's Sturmgeschutz. The T-34s were not as accurate, we thought at least, than ours. More Russian tanks poured forward. There were just too many. Wittmann headed for cover. He used the assault gun's low profile to hide it in a small wood. I like the Sturmgeschütz because uh, of the low silhouette. And that gave me a, 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 a feeling of being safer. But facing so many T-34s, there was nowhere for him to hide. Wittmann's driver swiveled the stool to bring its gun to bear on the Russian. Firing would have, would have definitely been an issue because of the inability to track a target via a turret. You would have to maneuver the vehicle. And again, his gunner scored a direct hit. With the T-34, the only weak part is uh, between uh, the, the turret and uh, the body to get right into the crack. Another T-34 tried to target the thin side armor on the Sturmgeschutz. Wittmann had to turn quickly and fire before the Russian got in a shot. You hit the tracks if you can. When the tracks uh, burst, of course, he just goes around in a circle. With his fast maneuvering, Wittmann began to even the odds. Then three more enemy tanks attacked. Wittmann opened fire. Only one of the Soviet tanks escaped. Six of the formidable T-34s destroyed in just a few minutes. Whitman and his crew stopped the Soviet armored attack. For his actions, Whitman is awarded the Iron Cross second class. Impressed by his exploits, Whitman's commanders send him back to Germany to train to become an officer of the SS. Whitman's career is on the rise. Autumn 1942, Bad Tulz, Germany. Michael Whitman begins his training in Heinrich Himmler's Waffen SS school. Its aim is to form a new SS military elite, the future leaders of Hitler's Nazi empire. Whitman graduates as an SS second lieutenant and is soon training on Germany's newest tank, the Tiger. Hitler's answer to the Soviet T-34, it is the most formidable tank in the world. At 100 millimeters, the Tiger's frontal armor is virtually impregnable. Its 88 millimeter gun can cut through a T-34 at over two kilometers. We were on Tiger, people were stolz, had the best Gerät, what we had, and it was Guter Panzer und wir waren zum ersten Mal den russischen Panzern haushoch überlegen. In February 1943, Whitman is called back to the Russian front as part of the Leibstandard's new Tiger Company. But by the summer, the tide of battle is turning against Germany. Soviet forces surge west creating a huge bulge protruding into the German lines near the Russian city of Kursk. Desperate to regain the initiative, Adolf Hitler plans a counteroffensive, Operation Citadel. 
It will be a two-pronged attack from north and south to chop off the bulge, leaving half a million Soviet soldiers cut off and trapped. For the Citadel Offensive, the Germans have amassed 780,000 men and 2,500 tanks. To meet the Germans, the Soviets field almost 2 million men and more than 5,000 tanks. The Leibstandart will be at the front of the southern attack. With them at the spearhead will be Michael Whitman, now commanding a platoon of five Tiger tanks. On the eve of battle, Whitman's commander reads out Adolf Hitler's message to the crews. Soldiers, today, you set out on a great offensive whose result can decisively affect the outcome of the war. My soldiers, now, finally, you have better tanks than the enemy. The German homeland looks to you with ardent confidence. We just thought we were superior to the, to the Russian tanks. At least we were brainwashed to believe that, which helps to make you feel superior, you know. You know what propaganda does. <laughs> July 5th, 1943. At dawn, the Tiger crews wait for their attack to begin. The order came over the tank radios. Panzers, forward! As we advanced, we were met by a relentless storm of fire. The Russians had prepared line after line of defenses dug in T-34s. Because the T-34 was inferior to the Tiger I, it needed to compensate for its deficiencies. One of the ways was to have pre-dug positions for the vehicles. The incoming round would have to penetrate several feet of dirt to be able to actually get to the vehicle itself. The Tiger's powerful 88-millimeter gun is able to break through the Russian defenses. while the Russian shells bounce off the Tiger's armor. Overcoming line after line of Russian defense, Wittmann and the Tigers push towards the objective. But the Russians continue to throw wave after wave of tanks at our advance. These were all fresh targets for Wittmann's gunner. Wittmann's tank kept moving, firing as it turned, smashing one T-34 after another. Knocking out eight tanks and 12 anti-tank guns, this first day of battle has been a success for Wittmann and his elite crew. We call it some gespielt, they are played together, you know, so that one interacts with the other the right way. The loader, the gunner, the commander, the driver, the radio man. It's a tightly knit group. July 12, 1943. The Germans set off to assault the final Soviet defense line before Kursk. Whitman's commander is wounded, and Whitman must take over command of the Leibstandart's Tiger Company, just as the Battle of Kursk is about to reach its climax. Unknown to the Germans, the Russians are preparing a desperate last-ditch counterattack. The Germans were on the verge of breaking through into open country, and the Soviets were starting to panic. They were going to throw whatever they had available into the mix. The Russians send 500 tanks west to attack the German right flank, but the Waffen-SS tanks turn east. These huge tank forces are about to collide near the little town of Prokhorovka. Second Lieutenant Whitman and his crew are ordered to high ground. In the distance, what seemed like a dust cloud was rising. Suddenly, hundreds of Soviet tanks appeared at the crest of a hill, headed straight towards Wittmann. 
we were in shock. The Soviets were not on the defensive, they were attacking. Just 1,600 meters from Whitman, more than 100 Soviet tanks are charging towards him over the gently rolling land of the steppe. We had a number of hills, but it was predominantly open terrain, so the Tiger tank could engage at long distance. With a well-aimed shot, a Tiger can knock out a T-34 at a distance of two kilometers. But the Russian tanks have to get much closer before their guns can have any effect on the Tigers. We are kam im Angriff, man, man muss sich das so vorstellen, Panzer, Panzer, die äh, große Kette. Und auf der anderen Seite kam die T-34 an. The T-34 is the race towards us, trying to close the deadly gap. They came back into view, now only 800 meters away. The Tigers opened fire. A lot of tanks in a relatively small area. Something of a shooting gallery from a Tiger I commander's perspective. The T-34s were still not close enough to penetrate the armor of the Tigers. So they had to keep advancing, straight through our barrage. They got to 700 meters. Getting closer. And closer. The Tiger guns were belching fire, but there were too many. They couldn't all be stopped. The Russians slam into the SS formation. At close range, the German tanks are vulnerable. Whitman's Tigers spring into action. Whitman's gunner fires on the move again and again. One of the reasons that Whitman was so successful as a Tiger commander was his ability to fire while moving on the, with the vehicle. That way they could acquire the target, but they'd, they'd get rounds on the target more quickly. Such a technique wasn't normal. In fact, German regulations stressed that the tanks should not fire when on the move. It's basically a waste of ammunition. But Whitman and his crew have mastered the difficult technique, using it to their advantage. From Whitman's perspective, Prokhorovka would have just been chaos. They would have had firing at close range. Whitman's tank is hit twice, but keeps on fighting. The Metzl on both sides, Panzer on Panzer. The battle rages for hours. The Russians take appalling losses. But they succeed in slowing the German advance. Bombila naše vjerat bombila nemetska. Ja dumam što oni ne rade da je celinska. Brasali bombu i što. Kursk is considered one of the greatest tank battles in history because of the numbers of tanks and other armored vehicles involved in a relatively small area. Our Tiger Company had a series of fine successes. Over the whole Citadel Kursk battle, we destroyed 151 enemy tanks. Despite the success of the Tiger units, the ferocious Russian defenses has stopped Hitler's offensive. The Germans have lost the decisive tank battle on the Eastern Front. From now on, Michael Whitman will be fighting for his and for Nazi Germany's survival. In its third winter on the Eastern Front, the German army is in full retreat. The Russians have pushed them 500 kilometers from Kursk 
back into the Ukraine. Michael Whitman's Tiger unit is fighting a series of desperate rear guard action. Tiger units would have been sent from one sector of the front to the other to try and plug gaps that had been opened up by Soviet armored forces and uh, attempted to uh, blunt them so that way German forces can continue their retreat to the west. The rapid Russian advance leaves the Soviet supply lines stretched dangerously thin, making supply convoys a vital necessity. December 6, 1943. Whitman and his unit, now designated the 101st SS Heavy Panzer Battalion, are poised to attack a Soviet supply convoy near the town of Brusilov. But between the convoy and the Tigers are batteries of Russian anti-tank guns. The Soviet 76.2 millimeter divisional gun is a tank killer. It can smash through a Tiger's side armor at a distance of nearly 1,000 meters and wreck its tracks. To kill these anti-tank batteries, Whitman's tactic is to play a dangerous game, using himself and his tank as bait. Whitman drove to high ground. He was tempting the Russian gunners to fire at him. They took the bait, but now the gunners had revealed their positions. Under heavy fire, Whitman quickly retreated. Then our Tigers raced at the anti-tank guns from their blind spots, charging straight at them before the Russians could turn the guns around. Whitman's tactic has worked. The anti-tank batteries are now a smoking wreck. But his tiger reveals just how dangerous Whitman's game can be. We counted a total of 28 hits on the tiger. Some of them were smaller, of course, but there were also some big enough to easily put one's fist into. With the anti-tank batteries eliminated, Whitman races towards the supply road. He drives into cover to observe the road, and he spots a convoy. Though he's heavily outnumbered, Whitman decides to attack on his own. Whitman would have been trying to make the best of a bad situation. He would have been increasingly reckless due to necessity in engaging enemy targets. Like a wolf attacking its prey, he quickly knocks out the lead tank and the rear tank, leaving the convoy trapped on the road at his mercy. Wittmann blasted the enemy with furious barrages of gunfire. He placed his fiery mark on the road, smashing long lines of Soviet vehicles into junk. This caused mass confusion among the Soviets. Whitman's daring lone wolf attack has worked brilliantly. The Russian convoy has been destroyed. Over the next few weeks, he goes on a rampage, knocking out 61 enemy tanks. His total kills soon reach 117. He paints the number of kills on his tank barrel. On January 16, 1944, Whitman is awarded the Knight's Cross, Nazi Germany's second highest military honor. Then, just a few weeks later, his Knight's Cross is upgraded with oak leaves, and he is promoted to first lieutenant. On February 2nd, 1944, Whitman is called to the Führer's Eastern Front headquarters. 
to receive his new commendation from Adolf Hitler himself. I think one of the reasons that Whitman was decorated to the degree that he was was that he was part of the Leibstandarte SS Adolf Hitler division, and that's Hitler's name in the unit. Whitman is now ordered back to Germany, where his exploits have already made him famous. But the country he finds upon his return is in ruins, a result of Allied bombing. The sight of such senseless destruction of our cities is enough to make one's heart bleed. The Anglo-Americans have taught us to hate. They will see this hate transformed into energy. We desire one thing, to get them in front of our guns. We have only one watchword, and that is revenge. The war effort was definitely going against Germany, and they were looking for ways to keep up the public morale. He visited the Henschel factory where the Tiger One was made and made a speech to the workers there. I think Whitman was used as propaganda for the Nazi party, but I don't think it was totally unwilling on his part. I think it was just another way of contributing to the war effort. The Reich made him a celebrity intentionally. During his triumphal tour of Germany, Whitman marries 19-year-old Hildegard Burmester. The couple is offered a special wedding gift, Adolf Hitler's Mein Kampf. Uh, Hitler went to Whitman's wedding. Uh, a tank case in Germany was so important. Before he can arrange a honeymoon for his young bride, Whitman receives a new posting. So his wife accompanies him with his Tiger Battalion to the Chateau Elbeuf in Normandy, France. Michael Whitman will soon have his chance at revenge on Germany's enemies. On June 6, 1944, Allied forces land in Normandy. Hitler orders his panzer forces to drive the Allies back into the sea. For Michael Whitman and his Tigers, the Allied beachhead is over 200 kilometers away. Whitman started off on June 6 with 45 Tiger tanks, which is a full complement for that 101st Heavy SS Tank Battalion. But it takes Whitman five harrowing days to get his second company to the Normandy battlefield, under unrelenting attacks by Allied fighter bombers that decimate his forces. And a week later, it was down to about six vehicles that were serviceable. Whitman and the 101st SS Heavy Panzer Battalion are positioned on the left and most crucial sector of the front, facing the British and the Canadians. The Germans would have concentrated their armored units around the British and Canadian sector because if that sector had fallen, that would have been the shortest route to Germany. So they had to hold that with their stronger units. The Allies are preparing the break out of the beachhead. Their plan is to send the British 7th Armored Division towards the key city of Caen, through the town of Villers-Bocage. June 13th, 1944. Sheltering from Allied bombers, Whitman positions his surviving Tigers under the cover of trees near Villers-Bocage. The British 22nd Armored Brigade was moving through the town. The column of British tanks is just 200 meters from Whitman's position. The British do not know Whitman is there, but they are about to find out. Then a man came into the command post and said, Obersturmführer, tanks are driving past. I don't think they're German. I had no idea that the enemy might suddenly appear. Whitman saw that there was an opportunity and that the British armored vehicles were in a nice, neat line approaching his position. I went outside and saw English and American tanks rolling past about 150 to 200 meters distance. 
Never had I been so impressed by the strength of the enemy as I was by those tanks rolling by. Whitman is facing 138 tanks and armored vehicles, while he has only six tanks. The decision to attack was a very difficult one, but I knew it absolutely had to be, and I decided to strike out at the enemy. Whitman's split-second decision will become legendary. I had no time to assemble my company. I set off with one tank. I drove up to the column, surprised the English as much as they had surprised me. I first knocked out two tanks from the right of the column, then one from the left. With them being in such close proximity to each other, there was no room to maneuver. I then turned about to the left and attacked the armored troop carriers in the middle of the armored regiment. They never left the road. They were so surprised that they took to flight, but not with their vehicles. Instead, they jumped out, and I shot up the battalion's vehicles as I drove by. I drove towards the rear of the column on the same road, knocking out every tank that came toward me. The enemy was thrown into total confusion. I was able to take out tanks as well as armored troop carriers. Then I drove straight into the town of villers bocage The town has already been occupied by British armor. Whitman continues his single-handed attack. claiming a total of 21 Allied tanks destroyed. I got to approximately the center of town, where I was hit by an anti-tank gun. My tank was disabled. I fired at and destroyed everything around me that I could reach. I then abandoned the tank. Whitman's deadly rampage has lasted barely 15 minutes, but he has devastated an entire enemy regiment. By single-handedly knocking out the British column, it kept the Allies from taking the area around Khan for two months, and it added to the mystique of Whitman's abilities as a panzer commander. German newsreels make the most of the Allied setback at villers bocage in den engen Straßen wurde eine stärkere amerikanische Panzereinheit gestellt und zusammengeschossen. Whitman is the most famous tank officer in the German army. But the following day, the stress of battle shows on his face. Whitman is celebrated for his astounding feat by 1st SS Panzer Corps Commander Sepp Dietrich who recommends him for yet another commendation. In July, Whitman is once again personally decorated by Hitler, this time adding two swords to his knight's cross with oak leaves. But Whitman was the most decorated tank commander, uh, not only for his experience on the battlefield, but I would think also for the propaganda value that could be showcased through him. And so Michael Whitman reaches the height of his fame in Normandy. And it is in Normandy that his fate and his myth will be sealed. August 8th, 1944, two months after villers bocage Michael Whitman is now a captain and acting commander of his battalion. Yet as Whitman's career soars, Hitler's army in Normandy is headed towards destruction. Now the Allies launch a decisive punch, codenamed Operation Totalize. 
British and Canadian armor storms along the Khan Falaise Road, smashing 14 kilometers through the German lines towards the village of Sinto. As 300 Allied tanks bear down on Sinto, the 12th SS Panzer Division is ordered to bar their advance. With the remnants of the heavily outnumbered division is Captain Michael Whitman with a small group of Tiger tanks. The division's leader, Colonel Kurt Mayer, now orders an immediate counterattack. Whitman's Tigers were standing ready behind a hedge east of Sinto. We had to risk the attack in order to win time. It was uh, almost suicidal for the Germans to mount that attack. But this was their system. If they were hit, they would hit back immediately. Whitman is in reserve, but he insists on leading the attack. Michael said to me, I must be in the attack myself, for the other officers can barely cope. Kurt Mayer knows the situation is hopeless. I shook Michael Whitman's hand. Michael left his youthful laugh and climbed into his tiger. And so Michael Whitman sets off on the attack. Just eight German tanks advancing against 300 Allied tanks. I don't think Whitman is exactly a fatalist. I don't think that he just figured that he was going to die. Maybe this was the best place to do it. Whitman and probably his crew didn't think so much about their own personal safety as the overall war effort. What Whitman doesn't know is there is a hidden danger waiting for him on either side of the Khan Falaise Road. British tanks of the Northamptonshire Yeomanry are lying in wait in the woods to his right. Canadian tanks of the Sherbrooke Fusiliers are hidden behind a wall to his left. We drove off, Michael right of the road and I left of the road. Approximately 800 meters to Michael's right, there was a small wood, which looked suspicious. The British tanks hidden in the woods observe Whitman. There were four, certainly four tigers, which came down on what would have been our side of the main road. The Canadians of the Sherbrookes were, as far as I can see, actually much nearer, but they were on the other side of the main road. The Canadian tanks are hidden from Whitman's view behind a long chateau wall. We sneaked up right beside a brick wall and got in reasonable cover. Just hit the wall just enough that you could get your gun, that you could move it sufficiently. I could see on the right the first German tanks came out from Sintho. Right away, I can remember the wireless net becoming active. I can see them, I can see them. I saw this dog has come in across in front of us, about 1,200 yards away. My tank commander, he said, we'll wait till they get to about 800 yards. We drove about one to one and a half kilometers. I was now starting to get a bit itchy. The Allies not only have the element of surprise, they have a new tank, the Sherman Firefly. The Firefly, upgunned with a powerful 17-pounder cannon, is able to penetrate 130 millimeters of steel, enough for even the thickest armor on a Tiger. For the first time, we realized that uh, we now had a tank which was equal to the Tiger. Whitman's Tigers are now in the kill zone. With my eyes, I could see the tank closest to the road, about two, 200 yards, I guess. The tank commander said, advanced driver, and we pull out of cover. As we pull out of cover, he says, um, target the rear target. 
or fog. We began taking heavy fire. And then I received a radio message from Michael. Achtung! Achtung! Von rechts! Oh, I'd look around at the second tank. I fired one shot at the second tank. The loader reloads. Again, far when ready. Three of the four Tigers are now knocked out. Whitman's tank moves on alone. From close range, the Canadians now open fire at Whitman's tank. The one that he was in, I think, went by me. Other people from my squad were firing at him now. Whitman's Tiger is hit. When I got to within 300 meters of Michael's Tiger, flames suddenly shot from the tank. I can remember a tremendous explosion and seeing the turret hit the ground. August 8th, 1944. Michael Whitman has fought his final battle. Whether his last thoughts as he went down the road were simply Valhalla, here I come, a sort of a death wish. He must have known there was no way they were going to win. August 25th, just days after Whitman's death, the German army in Normandy is defeated. Many of Hitler's soldiers remain in Normandy, buried in La Cam German military cemetery. Somber gravestones recall the unheralded end of the Nazi empire. Yet Michael Whitman is still celebrated. I, I think there's a myth to Michael Whitman's combat experiences. People look at him as, yes, being a Nazi, but it's not the reason that they admire his abilities in combat. I think if you're on the receiving end of that, you're going to have a different perspective. He uh, accepted the doctrines of uh, Hitler enough to get in his tank and, and invade other people's countries, country after country, to kill men, women, and, ch and children. He might have been a hero to the Germans, but uh, not to me. Even though it's been 60 years after Whitman's death, his legacy, his mystique, maintains to today. I swear to thee, Adolf Hitler, as Führer and Chancellor of the German Reich, obedience unto death. 